for having me. I, it's always nice when I can go somewhere where I don't have to get on a plane. So I live in Flemington, which is about half an hour from here, and it's, uh, it's always good. If I look a little bleary-eyed, it's because I was up late last night. Um, I was uh, still celebrating the Cubs World Series victory. Uh, someone said there was something else going on yesterday, but I, I didn't really catch that, so um, hopefully it wasn't too big of a deal. Um, <laughs> So uh, it is, it's fun to be here with you tonight. So can I just get a little bit of a sense of who you guys are? So I know we have a group of educators, so if you're an educator, raise your hand, and they're all sitting in the educator space over here. <laughs> um, parents, and I don't know if there are other would cover the rest of it, or is there, I don't know, anybody falls in the other category, but, okay, couple of people. And you are an educator too, though, right? And so I can go up. Okay, all right. So um, I do a lot of presentations to, obviously, schools, mostly, but I do a lot of parent presentations as well. I was telling Joel, um, the fewest I've ever had of a presentation is three. Uh, that was my first presentation ever, by the way. Um, and I've had uh, parent presentations of like six or eight, which is always fun, pretty, uh, pretty intimate, and get a chance to really have some conversation. But I want to make this as informal as we can tonight. So uh, I'm going to go through just some kind of high-level ideas fairly quickly, and then open it up at the end for anyone that wants to have a conversation about this. Um, I'm familiar with Joel's work and what the PLC does, and I'm familiar with other schools and other kinds of structures that put an emphasis on self-directed learning or self-determined learning, which is kind of a new term that a lot of people are using, which I find kind of interesting. Um, and my real work in the world is to try to help schools um, take traditional structures and systems and fit this type of thinking. And it's, as you can imagine, extremely hard. Um, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, there are very few schools that I will call, that I will say have gone from an old school type of structure and mentality to a bold school. This is my little phrase, right? But you know what I'm saying, right? Where they really decided to reimagine what they do and to kind of look at not just practices in the classroom, but also systems and um, cultures and structures and all those types of things. So normally that's what I speak about more than anything, but I'm going to tailor this a little bit more to kind of more of a high level conversation around what this looks like, under the assumption that most of you are here just to get a sense of what this looks like and, and what this is. Um, Joel mentioned a little bit about my background, but I'll just briefly tell you that um, my intersection to this conversation is kind of from three angles. First is I was a high school teacher for 22 years up at Hunter and Central. Uh, I left about 10 years ago now. Um, I own two teenagers, and you own two teenagers, so I think there's an there's a open bar for us. Um, <laughs> I had to make a call to my son because I took his keys away before I left. <laughs> you know, the 17 year old with a car gives you some leverage, right? So I took his keys away because he had just been sitting around for two hours, and I told him like eight times, you gotta clean the house, you gotta, you know, all this stuff. So I had to call him and tell him where his keys were. Um, and but the third piece of this is, is that uh, I really have been a self directed learner in kind of uh, web contexts, in online contexts now for uh, almost 17 years. Uh, I was one of the first education bloggers um, and wrote a lot about trying to figure out what the intersection of social media was with learning in schools and everything else. It's been a really interesting ride uh, this like, decade and a half. And uh, while I'm still a real optimist about that intersection between social media and learning, um, I have to say the last couple of years and maybe even the last few days <laughs> has made me really step back and take a look at some of the deeper complexities that are happening right now. Uh, I still think this is an amazing time to be a learner. In fact, I, I say that all the time. I can't imagine there's been a better time ever to be a learner. Um, if you have access to the web and you know what to do with it, you're literate in some sense with it, I can't imagine there's been a better time. But this is really complex, and it is getting much more complex. If we're asking kids to live in the world as self-directed, self-determined, if we ourselves are self-directed, self-determined learners in the world, um, that's not necessarily an easy or simple thing these days. Uh, and while it's powerful, it's also, like I said, something that I think we have to think quite a bit about. So like I said, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, and I just that's about 10 minutes ahead, right? So it's, just so I know, because those clocks, I could be done in five minutes according to those clocks, I don't know, but 7.40, okay. So, um, just 
really briefly, so what is this? You know, what are we talking about? Um, it's a little bit hard to pinpoint or to uh, kind of choose one definition around, but one that I, that I like is this one. It's that self-directed learn, directed learners choose what they want to learn, they choose how to learn it, and they choose why they want to learn it. And I think that a lot of schools, just briefly, to give you a sense of what I'm seeing, um, and, and I've been to 20 different countries, I've visited <coughs> thousands of schools, um, what I'm seeing is now schools are doing a little bit more around letting kids have some agency over what to learn, and they're doing a lot more here in terms of how to learn that stuff, but they're still owning, the schools still own the why. The schools, schools primarily don't give kids a lot of reason or choice to pursue things that they themselves are interested in. That they can say, I want to learn this because it's my passion or I need to or whatever else. So I kind of like that definition. And the why is, I think, the really important part of that. Now the other piece of it, right, we say self-directed learning. The other piece of it that I find really interesting is the lack of consensus around what this word means. And one of the things that I do in my work with schools is that this is the first question we ask. Well, what do we mean by learning? If we're going to talk about learning on any level, in any way, we have to at least have some common language around that. We have to have some common ways of thinking about that. So this is one of my two fam famous, uh, two famous, see, I'm a little clear here, two favorite Seymour, Seymour Saracen. Um, and he wrote a book with this title. And it's a great question. And, I, you know, if we had time, we would talk about this. I think parents, it's an interesting conversation to have with them. I think it's obviously interesting to have with educators. Interesting to have with kids, too. If you ask them, well, what, what does learning mean? What happens when you learn? What is that type of thing? I'm going to show you what he defines as learning. And I think it's probably the best definition that I've found. And it's one that, when I read it, it was one of those, if you ever read a book and you read a line, you kind of go, oh, OK. And you set the book down, your brain just kind of melts a little bit. And you have to sort out what it is that, well, here it is, he said. Productive learning is learning which engenders wanting to learn more. If you don't want to learn more, it's not productive. Now, you know, if you guys do a gut check right now, uh, the things that you have learned most powerfully and deeply in your lives, the things that you know more about than anything else, have you wanted to learn more about those things? Anybody in here an expert at something they find boring to tears? <laughs> right? So, if we don't want to learn more about it, Saracen is saying, it's probably not going to stick. It's probably not going not to stay in our brains or in our lives. And as a parent to kids, to teenagers, I see a lot of unproductive learning in school. I don't see them coming home a lot, kind of wagging their tails going, and not saying it this way, but suggesting it. I want to learn more about what I'm learning in school. Um, and, and please don't hear me say that, that I'm throwing schools or teachers under the bus. I mean, they go to my own school, they go to Harnett Central, and I know many of their teachers and their friends of mine. But the systems that they're in make it difficult for them to really give kids more of an opportunity or create the conditions under which they can learn productively. So that's kind of the way I think about it. Learning is the stuff that you want to learn more about. It's the stuff that matters to you in some way. It's the stuff that really um, changes you or, or motivates you uh, to, to learn more, to do more about it. So the question then becomes, in a school setting, but also out of school, so what are the conditions then that are required for people to want to learn more? What, what, what are, what are the, the conditions that we can create so that kids or we ourselves want to learn more about the things that we're learning? And again, if I had the time, we'd have a conversation about it. And I find this question really interesting, um, so interesting in fact, that I've been asking it of everybody over the last two years, and um, literally people from around the world. And I'm not kidding when I say it, probably 75,000 people at this point I've asked this question to. And um, the, the very interesting part of it to me is that every response I get to this question, and probably the response that's in your brains right now, falls on that list, right there. Almost every single person responding to that question says something along the lines of, well, you need passion. You need choice. You need a real purpose for doing it. You need 
not to be constrained by time. Um, you need teachers, it needs to be social, you have to feel safe and all those things, right? I'm not gonna read through all of them, but you know, I think if you look up on that list, probably you're sitting there going, yeah, that's a pretty good list. And again, because it resonates with your learning lives. When you guys learn, that's probably what's present. There's a reason for doing it. You have purpose and you have choice. You have agency and autonomy. What's interesting as well is what people never say. <laughs> and you know, it's it's on some level I get why we chuckle when we see that list, but it's not funny. <clears throat> it's not funny. The most classrooms that I walk into, basically, we're sitting in rows, and don't I? You know, I, I don't want to see irony of this, but. So. <laughs> but <laughs> It's only for a few more minutes. Um, but it is, it's teacher control. There's no real world application. I can count on one hand, maybe two, the number of times in 23 years of, of uh, collective public and some private school education in there that my kids actually did something that lives in the world, that solved a real problem in the world, that had a real audience for that work. Hardly ever happens in my kids' lives. Um, it is about grades, it is about um, GPAs, it's about tests, it's about those types of very traditional ways that we score things because, to be honest with you, oh, let me ask, have you, as a parent or as an educator, have you ever heard of a, an assessment for curiosity? <laughs> have, you ever got, have your kids ever gotten a grade or been given a grade in curiosity or creativity or persistence or any of that stuff, right? It's hard to measure that, so we don't. We measure the easy stuff. If, I, went into the, I went into my son's grades today. And I don't do this very often because I'm not about grades, but he needs, for various reasons, he wants to go to college, he wants to play basketball in college, so he needs to keep his grades up. And so I went in there today and I saw he said he's got an A minus in physics grade. I have no idea what he's learned in physics, if anything, but I know he's getting an A minus, so it's all good. And it is all he cares about is maintaining that A. Um, he's not really caring too much about learning. He's just focused on what he needs to do to maintain that grade. And that resonates with me because I did that a lot in school, and probably many people in this room did that a lot in school too. This hasn't changed very much. But this is a problem. This is a problem. And this is the biggest problem that I think we have in schools, is this disconnect between what we believe and what we do. And it's acute because in many cases, our kids now are living in a world where they go home or go outside of school and they're on this side of this slide. They're pursuing things that they care about. For instance, and at every age, by the way, how many know a kid who plays Minecraft? Probably just about everyone knows a kid who plays Minecraft. Raise your hand if that kid learned how to play Minecraft in a workshop. <laughs> no, that kid had a passion. He had a, a real you know, reason for doing it. He had teachers, I'm sure, he had autonomy. He wasn't constrained by time. He didn't do 45 minutes of Minecraft, as much as many of us wish he would only do 45 <laughs> minutes of Minecraft. But it's not something that, these, these conditions that exist in their lives now are pretty powerful. And so when they walk into those conditions, there's a little bit more of a disconnect. And you wouldn't, you know, you guys wouldn't like to see that, but I said, okay, everybody in the room who's like 35 years old, let's go sit over in that corner, and you can only talk to the other 35 year olds the rest of the evening. You all be like, what? What are you doing? Why would you do that? If we were to, if this was the let's start a school meeting, which side of the slide would we start on? Would we start over there on the right? I don't think so. Not if we had license to build whatever we wanted to. If I said, we're going to build a school, we can make it whatever we want. We're going to start with, uh, I think this should be in rows. <laughs> that wouldn't be the first thing that we would say. I think that we should, you know, really hang grades over their heads. Because that's such a great motivator for kids to learn. No, we'd start over here. We'd start over here. So, here's the deal. Our kids, by and large, are in school situations where they're learning very differently from the way they learn outside of school. And I know not every child has access, and I know that not every child, even who has access, knows how to use that access really well. Um, but there's no question now that if you have access, that the affordance of that access is powerful and can be life-changing 
in a lot of ways. And I, I you know, I, I only say this when my wife's not in the room, but aside from having kids, access has probably been the most transformative thing in my life. It really has. Because of what, the people that it's allowed me to meet, the questions that I've been able to grapple with, the information, the knowledge, the technologies. It's amazing. So our kids live in a world where they have the sum of human knowledge in their pockets, pretty much. I was in, actually, this is the weirdness of my life, but I was in Moscow two months ago with Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, up on stage watching him present. And one of his slides says the mission of Wikipedia is to collect the sum of human knowledge in one place. Should be if a week or so, right? <laughs> but imagine that. Collect the sum of human knowledge in one week. Um, but look, I get it. There's a lot of crap in this picture. There's a lot of stuff that isn't great knowledge. You have to have a really good crap detector right now, right? If you're gonna, and the last few weeks, I think, have shown that as well. And that's only going to get worse, by the way. That's what I was alluding to before. This is a, an amazing, amazing development. But if you think it's complex now, just wait. Because a lot of what's happening with social media is that our attention is changing, our, our kind of ability to focus is changing. Um, it's much easier to simply run to people who you agree with than to grapple with the people who you don't agree with. And now, whatever you believe, there are people who agree with you that you can find. It's not like if, you've, if you're living in a neighborhood of 25 people and you're the only person that believes what you believe, there are millions of people who believe what you believe, whatever you believe now. And so it's easy to kind of find those people. But on balance, I still think this is an amazing opportunity if we know how to use it. We also have access to three and a half billion people online. And a lot of people look at this and they say, well, this is really scary. Because there are a lot of people in this picture who are represented in this picture who want to do us harm. They want to steal our social security numbers. They want to take our bank accounts. They want to do all that really bad stuff. And I get it. But I think this has probably been the most profound development in my life. Because I have met people from around the world who share my interests and passions, who have pushed me to greater heights, who have challenged my beliefs in ways that is not possible in physical space. There just aren't enough people in my physical space world, in my face-to-face -face world, where I can have these types of conversations um, at the scale that I can have them here. So it's really cool. But like I said, there's a lot of junk here. So I'm going to, just a little temperature check, just to see if you're still awake, too. Um, I'm going to see how you feel about this right now. So if you'd all just play along, raise your right hand, please. Just raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I want to be found, I want to be found by strangers on the internet. You okay with that? <laughs> a lot of people are like, no, I'm not okay with that at all. Okay, so you do. You want to be found by strangers on the internet. Now, you need to be able to discern the good strangers from the bad strangers. You need to have that literacy. But if you don't want this in your life, then you are limiting your learning and your conversations to only the people in your face-to-face -face world. And those people may be really great people and really smart and really passionate and everything else, but they don't compare to what's possible here. Um, and so, again, this is an amazing thing that's happened, but it's complex. And then there's this, two million apps in the App Store. Um, you know what the average life of an app is now on your phone, or on the App Store? About two weeks. That's it. They go up and down, up and down, up and down. People are just throwing stuff up there literally to see if something maybe catches on or whatever else. Um, and so it's a little bit overwhelming, but, but you know, hey, this is it. Now, we now live in a world of abundance. And this is not the world that schools were built for. You get that, right? Schools were built for the idea that if you wanted to learn algebra, you had to come to this classroom on this particular day with these particular group of kids who are your same age from your same neighborhood to be with this particular teacher to go through this particular particular curriculum at this particular pace and be assessed in this particular way because if you didn't go through that experience, odds are you weren't going to learn algebra or French or history or chemistry or anything that's in the school curriculum. Now. Well, the whole school curriculum now happens to be everywhere. And no disrespect to the people in the room, but there are probably better teachers online around those particular pieces of the curriculum than you can find in your face-to-face -face world. And I know that too, because when I was teaching The Secret Life of Bees, anyone read that book, Secret Life of Bees, Sumo Kid? 
I was teaching that in 2002, and I was had my kids had a blog online where they were putting up artistic interpretations and responding to the characters and themes and all that kind of stuff. And as much as I tried to help them understand that book, I didn't come close to Sumon Kid helping them. He was in the blog with my kids, answering their questions at that. Um, and that taught me very quickly the power of that space. So um, here it is. Pretty much, if you have access and you know what to do with it, pretty much, you can learn anything you want, anytime you want, anywhere you are, with whomever you can find. And there's not a person in this room that isn't doing something along these lines. There's not a person in this room that hasn't gone to YouTube and started a search with, how do I change a muffler or get a divorce? Whatever it is you're looking to do, right? Um, and we do it from our phones now. Some of us do it while we're driving, which we shouldn't do. But you know what I'm saying, right? It's easy. It's not hard. And, and we can have a discussion, and we should have a discussion as to whether or not that's learning, and whether or not that's really deep learning, or is that just kind of surfacey stuff. But I think there's a lot of deep learning that happens in those kinds of interactions as well. So it's amazing, but it's complex. And welcome to it. This is not what I was expecting to parent around. Um, and when I was an educator, it wasn't that complex. Today, when I talk to teachers, this is not what they signed up for when they went into education. Um, this is a really interesting kind of shifty moment. But here's the thing, right? Whether you're a parent or an educator or whatever else, if you're looking at the world and you're, you're looking at your kids and you say, they have access to all the information and knowledge, all those people, all those technologies. And I said to you, you can only choose one thing to make sure that your kids learn how to do, given that context. I'm pretty sure, as my other favorite Seymour, favorite Seymour says, it would be the skill of being able to learn. That if they are not learners right now, Good luck. Good luck. Because the people who are, and the people who know how to use that access really well and how to continually learn, those people are going to have a better chance, I think, without question, of flourishing in the world that's coming at us than the ones who are waiting to be told what to learn, when to learn, how to learn it, and how they're going to be assessed on it. So, um, there's a book I'm reading right now called Deep Work, which is kind of frying my brain a little bit. And it's about the attention piece of it. But his thesis, and I think it's absolutely accurate, is that if you cannot learn things deeply and quickly on your own, it's going to be difficult for you to thrive. Um, it's going to be difficult to basically compete. And I don't really like that word, because this shouldn't be just about competing with other people. Um, but that's a part of it. You know, I mean, we all have to find our way. Our kids are going to have to find their way through that as well. So we're really talking now about learning amplified with technology. And I think it's really cool on a lot of levels. But, you know, like I said, there's some challenges here. We're up to, kids are now up to about nine hours of digital media a day. And um, basically, that means that if they're sitting on the couch, typing on the computer, texting, and watching TV, that counts as three hours. So it's not like nine full hours, just, you know what I'm saying. It's the combination of all those things, but that's not slowing down, and we're right there with them. The adults are not too far behind in terms of our use of digital media. 92% of teens are going online daily. 24 of them are online constantly. They're the ones that don't shower. Um, <laughs> and 75% of them now have access to a smartphone, which is a big deal, which is a really big deal. And this number is growing. Uh, it's going to continue to grow. It's growing globally. By the end of this decade, 5 billion people are going to have access to a smartphone. Five billion people, and if you don't think that's going to change things, think again. It already is beginning to change things in emerging countries, where this is the school, this is the education that they um, are they have access to. And if those kids, especially in those emerging countries who don't have access to any type of schooling or education, if they are not self-directed, self-determined learners, um, they're really going to suffer. But most of them are because they are craving it. They don't have it. And so when they get access, they're doing some pretty amazing things. You can take courses now um, from major universities around the world. These are called Massively Open Online Courses. Anyone ever take one of these? Or Yeah, look at that. Everybody on the right-hand side is taking a move. Um, and you know, good, bad, what do you think? OK, 
okay, you know, yeah, right? It's not like, you know, it's not like a, like a full-fledged college course or anything like that, but I mean, if you are interested in Japanese pronunciation for communication, then you can take that course from Waseda University. Or if you are interested in robotics and robotics and in society, you can take that from Queensland University in Australia. And in most of these cases, if you take the course, you get to the end of it, you've completed all the work, you get a certificate. And if you build up a bunch of certificates, now people are beginning to build badges around what you know. So we're kind of moving into Boy Scout territory here. You get a, you get a badge for robotics because you've taken, you know what I'm saying, right? And there's still, this is really still messy, but if we're talking about the accreditation factor, it's coming. The self-directed accreditation factor is almost here. And um, basically, it's just a matter of figuring out how are we going to how are we going to find uh, rigor in those badges, or how are, how are we going to know that it's a good badge rather than a fly-by-night badge, if you know what I'm saying, right? Just like we have to deal with with diplomas. Here's one site that I think is kind of interesting. This is Allison. And Allison has been used by over, um, I think it's six million people now. They've given out a million, no, 150,000 diplomas, but diploma in building an online business, diploma um, in occupational hygiene, want that. These are all free. You can get a diploma in psychology. Now look, I want my psychologist probably to be trained at a really good school. I don't want my psychologist to be trained on YouTube or certainly not my surgeon. Um, you know, so I'm not suggesting that everything should be self-taught and that we should just be, you know, if you have the surgery badge, you can operate on it, right? That's, that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that within that context, if you're thinking about being a surgeon, go. you can pretty much take some, a lot of free self-directed courses on what it's like to be a surgeon and figure it out instead of paying $62,000 a year to go to college and find out that that's not really what you want to do. So there's all sorts of those kind of interactions that are happening that I think is pretty interesting. And now this is, this is interesting. If you want an MBA, if you're self-motivated, self-directed type of learning, you want an MBA, go to the University of Illinois online, take the whole coursework for free. You can take the entire course for free. You want the degree, it will cost you 20 grand. But at what point are employers going to look at candidates and say, can you do the work? Do I really care if you got the degree? Um, can you show me that you have the skills, that you have the abilities to do that? That's already happening in a lot of different places, um, who was it, uh, Ernst & Young, I don't think I have it in here, but Ernst & Young in the UK has now said uh, they're not requiring college degrees any longer. Because what they found internally in an internal study that they did was college degree was no real indicator of any greater skills or ability to do the work. And so by, by requiring that, they were limiting their pool of applicants. And that now they've opened it up Penguin's done the same thing. Google's been talking about that for a long time. Uh, I'm not saying that the college degree is not still something that is worth working toward. But it is, there are questions now. And in fact, the survey just came out last week. I think it's now 57% of people in the United States aren't sure that a diploma is worth the cost. 57%. I don't know how to feel about that, to be honest with you. Right? because I think that's one of those big shifts that we're in the middle of that I'm not sure how we make sense of that in the moment, but definitely happen. So here's the deal. In this world, with access to so much stuff, to so many people, to so many technologies, learning is the world. It doesn't matter what job you do any longer. If you're not constantly learning, you need to be. And, you know, that holds true for us as educators, those educators, you educators in the room as well, who by and large, I think, and again, I don't know anything about the people in the room, but as a general statement about the, education, the educators that I've met and the schools I've gone to, I think by and large, we've kind of rested our teaching laurels a bit, um, and we haven't really kept up with a lot of things that have changed. I love this quote from Harold, you know, this is the network era. Our workplaces, economies, and societies are becoming highly networked. The transmission of ideas can be instantaneous. There's no time to pause, go to the back room, and develop something to address our learning needs. The problem won't change by then. We need to learn as we work. 
And now you hear CEOs who are saying this as well. Here's the CEO of AT&T, who a few months ago came out and said, uh, if you are not spending five to 10 hours a week in online learning, you will obsolete yourself. You will obsolete yourself. So, you know, the question for me as the parent of two teenagers, and the question for us as educators who are working with kids, um, you know, on a regular basis, and the question for parents, is how do we develop those dispositions and those literacies and the skills that go along with making sure that we will have kids who will be constantly learning, who will want to learn more on a regular basis, who will pursue that on their own without being told to do that or waiting for someone to tell them to do that. Um, because that is a, a big differentiator right now. And that's a huge question because again, you know, the left-hand, right-hand side of that slide, the left-hand side is more conducive to that type of work. The right-hand side, not so much, not so much. The right-hand side basically diminishes, I think, those skills and those dispositions. Um, and that's really problematic. You know, I, I, th I do think it's interesting, I'll just make a comment too, that I think there are a lot of people in education now who are looking at it and kind of going, yeah, you, you know, it, it does need to change. Um, we have been doing this now for, couple hundred years pretty much in the same type of system and uh, the system has changed along the way but there hasn't been a fundamental reimagining of it. Look at all the reimagining that's happening outside of schools right now. Look at the reimagining of music and art. Look at the reimagining of business. Look at the reimagining of politics. Right? I mean, so I think most people are, are at that point where they're like, we need to do it, but in education, they feel that still that the barriers are so huge to really trying to move in that direction that it's really tough. And one of the big problems is parents, who and students, by the way, who we've trained really well to expect to be told what to learn, when to learn, right? But also parents who have this internal reality of what it's supposed to look like and feel like and smell like, and so when their kids come home and they kind of get that same story coming back to them, yeah, chemistry sucked and I got a B, or you know something within that. And it's like, you don't feel great about it, but at least you know, at least you, you know what's going on there, right? Whereas if, 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 you know, your child came home and said, and you said, so what'd you do at school today? Said, oh, I was building a skateboard all day long, and it was really cool. And tomorrow I'm going and advocating for a skate park and to the town council. You'd be like, well, when, is there a test? on that? How does, how does that grade show up in the grade book? You know what I'm saying? And so a lot of teachers, and I think a lot of educators feel this, you know, that this is this kind of moment where we're, we're trying to figure it out. So you get kids now who are doing really interesting things, and again, if I had a little bit more time, I'd kind of suss this out a little bit more um, and, and show you some more examples. But just a couple. So I have, um, I don't how many of you use Twitter? Anyone tweeting right now? Uh, the superintendent back there is like <laughs> keying away. Um, <laughs> so I have a standing search on Twitter um, that looks for any time the term students create or students invent or, you know, along like three or four along those lines. So anytime that's mentioned on Twitter, it comes up in a column that I have on one of my little Twitter things that I use, right? Twitter tools that I use. So every now and then I get these that I think are just interesting. So here's a girl. South Africa, who are having a really bad drought, and so she figured out somehow that avocado peel and orange peels um, hold like 100 times their weight in water, um, so they can alleviate some of the drought stuff that's going on. Um, and here's another one that I love, this girl who just had a passion for wedding dresses, so she made one out of divorce papers. Um, <laughs> and, you know, um, just, you know, just kids who are, and these are in the context of school, by the way, um, but still, school's giving them license to, to pursue things that they want to learn more about, that they want to create, that they want to do, and not kind of forcing them to walk within these kinds of rigid expectations that schools have set for them over the long term. So there are lots of, art, there's lots of stories and lots of examples of this stuff, and then there are a couple schools that um, really do this as their function, right? As their, as their base kind of philosophy. One is Sudbury schools. 
And by the way, here's my self-promotion moment, right? So I wrote a book called Freedom to Learn um, and basically talk uh, quite a bit about Sudbury and about other people who are um, basically trying to figure out what this looks like in school settings and also what it means on a larger scale. But um, So Sudbury basically says um, you can direct your own learning from the get-go and we will support you in any way that we can to learn the things that you care about, the things that you want to learn more about. But here's the deal, you are a part of a democratic culture within the school in which you must participate. So when you go to Sudbury School, you may only learn kind of narrow content things, right? You're not gonna get the full curriculum, probably, because you're just gonna pursue the things that you're interested in, but man, are you gonna be a citizen, right? Because you are participating in the hiring and firing of teachers. You are participating in budgets and in long-term planning and in design and all those types of things. You are a member of a school community. And that is the, real, the only real kind of um, comprehensive learning objective <coughs> from all the kids. And that is they participate in a democratic society within that. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, schools by and large are the least democratic societies, least democratic cultures. So, um, Sudbury is one, and then you'll find these little one-offs. I just love this one in Switzerland, up in the mountains. And basically, they just say, free time for children. Um, the basic value is, and this is translated from the German, so it's a little you know, stodgy, that's why, but everyone knows for themselves. Reggio Emilia, I don't know if you've heard of Reggio. It's kind of a Montessori type of thing, uh, but not quite. A little bit, some variations on the themes, but um, I'm reading uh, the 100, 100 Languages of Children, and uh, Loris Malaguzzi, the guy who um, put together Reggio Emilia, has a great line in there where he says, we should only teach things that kids are capable of learning on their own. And that's another one of those put the book down moments and kind of try to sort out exactly what that means, right? But what he's saying is, we should give kids freedom, we should let kids pursue the things that they care about, and then help them kind of pursue that in the ways that they find really interesting or uh, important to them. So um, that's kind of a quick overview. Um, but you know, the bottom line here, for me at least, uh, I think you know, when you talk about self-directed learning, you're talking about Dewey. You're talking about a lot of the great thinkers about education, the, the progressive, real progressive thinkers. One quote from Dewey that I use all the time is, um, schools should teach kids anything they want to learn, something along those lines, right? And when he said that 100 years ago, I'm sure a lot of people were like, well, there's no way we can do that. But today, um, yeah, I think it might be a little bit easier to allow kids to pursue the things that they really are interested in and help them develop as learners first, um, and to really you know, help them create those skills and literacies and dispositions that aren't on the test, but maybe are more important for them to have with them as they go into their lives. And, um, you know, just a quick, you know, I don't know, it's probably political, but um, I, I pulled, we pulled our kids off the test every year. Our kids never took the test. And the reason was because I just, none of us, my wife nor I, saw it as a great way of measuring what they've learned, because to us, learning is more long-term. And I, well, by the way, would not be able to pass high school right now in the state of New Jersey, because I would fail the math assessment horrible. Um, I would have to you know, be remediated. <clears throat> but um, it is about that immeasurable stuff that most people now, even in business and even in higher ed now, are really looking for. Um, it's about a skills gap that is more, much more acute than the knowledge gap any longer. Because knowledge is everywhere. So the skills, the abilities to find it, to learn, to apply it, to make sense of it, to find patterns within it, to find problems, not just solve problems, but to find problems with it. Those are the types of skills and dispositions that um, a lot of employers are missing right now. They don't see that coming out. And I do think a lot of that is because of what we do to kids in schools 